Um, we want to welcome you all tonight as we look at uh, Barnabas who stood in the gap. And um, I trust that this has been a, a series that has challenged you to fill the gap because no matter what church you go to, there's gaps that need to be filled. In the community you live in, there's gaps that need to be filled. In your home. So, I hope this has been a challenging series to you, and I hope you've been able to apply this in your life. Um, so, just before we start, I'm going to, Chris, can I ask you to open in prayer for us, please? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to, to gather, Lord, to look into your word and uh, to look at these various stories of uh, men, women standing in the gap and accomplishing what you've called them to do. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you uh, speak to us, um, highlight those areas in our lives where you're calling us to be the ones standing in those gaps and give us the courage and the faith to, to do just that. When our eyes of the flesh can't see uh, how, how we should or how it will work out, help us to have eyes of faith as these men and women had to, to stand and accomplish. Pray you bless our time here in Jesus' name. Amen. This, was a, this one of Barnabas was a challenging one. Because not only did God call him to stand in the gap, but he put his life on the line. Because he did not know whether the person he was going to, he had to take it on God's word that he would be safe. But he had to trust God and he had to move forward. So let's look at it and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't know in you. Drive through any city long enough and you eventually get to that part of town. A part where you have one or two reactions. One might think, how can anyone want to live here? While others see potential. In the Bible, there was someone who operated with that potential point of view. His name was Barnabas. He was the kind of person who could see the hidden potential. That's what he saw in a man named Saul. Where people saw a religious zealot, Barnabas saw passion. Where people saw a haughty intellectual, Barnabas saw a brilliant teacher. Where people saw a villain, Barnabas saw hero. And it's because of Barnabas we now know Saul as Paul, the apostle. A man responsible for two-thirds of the New Testament. An argument can be made that without Barnabas, there would be no Paul. So what does it take to see the best in people? It takes wisdom and a lot of patience. It takes generosity and sacrifice. Christians should be like Barnabas and stand in the gap for others. We have truly incredible opportunity to be the source of life and life and hope for those around us. No matter what difficulty or calamity we face, those of us who have experienced the transforming grace of Jesus Christ can also share the grace with others in a world that can really use it. Some of us Christians are not, are naturally glass half empty people. The kind of people who can't help but look at the world and find the negative. And then there are some of us who are naturally glass half full people who look for the good in both situations and those people in the situations. We should be like Barnabas. We should stand firm knowing that God is in control because he makes all things, yes, all things work together for good for those who love him. He wants us to look for the good. He wants us to stand in the gap and be encouragers. What does that mean to encourage? Is literally to put courage into someone who's weak and vulnerable. In our story today, we will see someone on the surprising end of an encouragement, enabled by someone who stood in the gap. Thank you. 
Carol, right now. Carol, give me your hands. Stop fighting. Stop. Give me your hands right now. Go, man. Stop fighting. Let me go. Stop fighting. No right six, I got one in custody. Get me, man. Christians and ended up 
being a dedicated follower of Christ. That change put Saul in a sticky predicament. His former allies now conspired to kill him for preaching about Jesus. And the Christians didn't believe his conversion was genuine. It was shaping up to be a real rumble. So when he went back to Jerusalem, a man without a country, without friends or home, that's when Barnabas stepped into the gap for Saul. Barnabas believed what God saw. He saw Saul's unlimited potential. He knew who he could become. He immediately vouched for him to the leaders of the church. And because Barnabas had street cred, the whole Christian community took him at his word and accepted Saul as one of their own. Let me ask you, are you a Barnabas for someone? Do you have a Saul in your life? In our story, the young man, Ty, is in a sticky predicament. He doesn't have a place of his own, a place where he truly belongs. The world has told him that he's hard to love, and he's decided that the world is right. You see, Ty is living in poverty, and not just the economic kind. He has a poverty of feeling unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. And in many ways, this is the greatest poverty there is. But Officer William is willing to see past that and stand in the gap to help Ty change the direction of his life. And like Barnabas, Williams sees the treasure buried in Ty's heart and a treasure he hopes he can help Ty uncover. That's good, all right? Get that boy on your paper for you. All right, hit the shelf. You dump it up. Are you a champ or a trainer or something? No, I'm a cop. One you hit this morning. <laughs> you got quite a left hook. But you also got quite a situation. What you did this morning is not excusable. We'll figure out how to handle that if you promise to help the old man out and up at 4 a.m. At 4 a.m.? <laughs> you up robbing somebody at 3. Look, you don't live very far. I got your bike. Get here early. Help the old man out. Every day. Can I work out after? Maybe. After school. You gonna train me? Start with those gloves first. Then we'll see about the other ones. What's up with that? I told you. 
keep your hands up. Come on, man. Let's go again. Keep them up. Good. Good. Red. Keep your hands up. I'm warning you. This is bug, man. You're crazy. Why are you hitting me like that? I'm done. All right. Go put the other gloves back on. Now, I thought you were ready for the real ones. I am ready. Go back to mopping, man. You're a quitter. I'm not a quitter. You're not? You just quit when it started to hurt? You quit in my car when you're okay with going to jail? Man, you don't know me. You're right. I don't know you. But I know you got something in you. Something you don't even see yet. Ain't nobody got a hook like me. He's got a hook, ladies and gentlemen. So what? You got to keep your hands up. And you've been swinging your whole life. If you don't figure out how to slip anything, you're always going to get hit. Your mom is in jail. Your dad is in jail. And you're in foster. The world is throwing hard punches at you. But you got to learn to take it. Or slip. You can't just let it hit you. And if it does, you can't quit. I'm ready, man. Can you try again? Okay. Your hands up, man. sacrifices along the way. That's part of mentorship. And that's why Barnabas was so good at it. In the Bible, Barnabas had been sent to a town called Antioch, where he would work among the Christians there. He made an impact, encouraging them and drawing even more people to Christ. We might say today that he had a thriving ministry there in Antioch. But in the midst of all that success, he heard Saul was living in a nearby Tarsus, and probably have been for some time. So Barnabas, he took a trip. While there in Tarsus, Barnabas located Saul and brought him back to Antioch. Barnabas knew that Saul needed an encouragement, but he also knew that being an encourager often involves sacrifice. He didn't wait for Saul to come to him. He left the comfort of a growing ministry to find one person, y'all, one person, one man who would eventually take the gospel to the farthest reaches of civilization. This level of sacrifice doesn't happen without amazing generosity, which, interestingly enough, it's something that was built right into Barnabas' name. Oh, well, his nickname, I mean. You see, Barnabas was born with the name Joseph, but because his impact on others was so positive, he earned the nickname the word bar means son of. Nabas means encouragement. So Barnabas was literally a son of encouragement. Imagine what it must have meant to Saul to have that guy take him under his wing. It must be kind of like how Ty feels with Officer William taking him under his wings. Barnabas had an extraordinary gift. His gift was to recognize the gifts within others and then to demonstrate God's amazing love, forgiveness, and acceptance to them, believing that it would transform those people so they could, like Saul, could reach out and accept those who had formerly been enemies. We can all make decisions like that. Decisions like the one Barnabas and Officer Williams are making. To look at someone first, then act on their behalf to stand in the gap for them. I know I have people in my life like that. People who are worth the sacrifice. People who just need a little injection of courage. People that I can encourage. Barnabas stood in the gap and fought for Saul. Officer William stood in the gap and fighting for Ty. Is there anyone in your world that you need to fight for? Who is that person? What kind of transformation can you help bring about in their life? In our story, it feels like Ty is going through a transformation right now. And thanks to the encouragement of Officer Williams. But let's see what happens when the stakes 
get a little height. He's scared, man. Nobody can handle this. What you want to do, champ? He wasn't ready anyway. He's scared. Nobody wants this. This gym is whack. Bunch of bombs. Old bombs. Control your fighter, Ozzy. It makes me look bad when my own fighter is about to show up to my own gym. Nobody wants this. Any of you said he's got what it takes? Ten minutes. Hey, Red. Come here. I know he's got a hook, but is he ready? He's ready. Let's watch. Come on. Stay, man. Was it ever scared you? I heard you hit a cop once. This is how you start your career. This is a real fight. It's time to show them that things can change after this. You got something special. Something special worth fighting for. Tell him. Tell the world that you're somebody. You've been working, man. Putting in real work on your own. This guy's a punk. A little bigger than you, but he'll know what it's like to fight. You do. What are we waiting for? Put him on his back. And keep your hands up.
Are you making sure that every interaction with them focuses on the positive, on the ways God brings grace and real transformation into their lives? Hey, congratulations. Maybe it's time to take some action. And maybe it's time to love someone tenaciously. They'll never be the same. And neither will you. You will see what happens when God's people stand strong. Join me in this prayer. Say this. Lord God, move today into the gap of pain, the gap of sorrow, the gap of brokenness. Use a believer who's filled with your love and mercy to walk into that gap and believe for the miracle you want to do. Your will is to restore us, and we trust you to do that work in us and through us, starting right now, and we will witness what happens when God's people stand strong. Half a million children loving foster care in America. and I'm putting somebody on the spot. <laughs> Chris, I'm going to ask you, you and your wife have chosen to stand in the gap with the children that are out there. Um, you have 13, correct? Um, is it two or three that are your biological children? Uh, three biological. Three? And the rest, um, did any of them come out of a foster home situation? Uh, nine of them adopted through the foster. Through the foster. Through, yeah, Arizona. Do you want to tell us a bit about your experience with it and, and what it's meant to you in your life? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, our, our start was why we moved to Arizona originally feeling like this is where God said to be. At that time we had a one-year-old, my parents' first grandchild, her parents' third grandchild, everybody was back east. Um, and while we were out here, first place we rented, just rented, and that was coming to an end and we were praying, somebody introduced us to um, a program called Cares by Apartment Life where we moved in kind of as missionaries into an apartment complex. Uh, and it was there that the next door neighbor, she had some mental health issues and was very neglectful towards her children, uh, would knock on our door because we built a relationship with them. And uh, we'd just say, hey, my kids are sleeping. Could you listen for them? I'm gonna go play on the computer. And said, no, bring them over here. Eventually they moved away and up to this point, my wife and I, we talked about adoption someday, <coughs> um, but my wife had said, I don't think I could ever do foster care, it'd be too hard if they had to go home. <coughs> so they moved away, Melissa had reached out and said at one point, um, my space was the social media back then, said that <coughs> they took my kids and the CPS took her kids. So that caused, my wife called me at work that day, and you know, what do we do? And so she made a call to uh, CPS at the time, and they said, these kids are in a, a good home, um, you're not family, you're not connected, we're not going to disrupt them from the home that they're in, they have stability there. And they just said, if you are interested, go take <coughs> this class, which was an introduction to foster care. Um, and it was at that class when we left, my wife says it would be really difficult if we cared for a child 
and they did have to go home. And if it wasn't difficult, we didn't love that child the way we should have uh, while they were with us. And so we decided to get licensed uh, for foster care with the option to be able to adopt if that child became adoptable. Um, and we figured one or two, we'd help one or two kids. So um, that time we'd had our second daughter, my wife said, I don't want to be pregnant again, postpartum, after she suffered with, and then it was a real intense labor delivery, and so I said, okay. So we started foster care Skyler, uh, who we adopted, he's 15, September he'll be 16, came to us at two days old. Lots of little steps to step into the gap. Um, we licensed, they do a background check on you, fingerprint clearance, look into everything, they come into the home and make sure every smoke detector works, all that stuff. Um, you know, well that was the easy part. Um, then we started, when we first got licensed, it was a call. Every time the state was removing the child, they would put it out to the various agencies, licensing agencies. And those agencies would reach out and then the state had two hours to find family that the children would be safe with, biological family of the children, or um, a, a foster placement. I think we had 20 or 30 calls within the first week of getting licensed. And so it was, we said yes, I think, to every, everyone that we would be willing. And my wife says, Chris, I keep sensing a two-day-old baby boy. Every time I think, I think a two-day-old baby boy, I said, okay. At one point, it kept being like, you know, expecting, and then it not coming, expecting and it not coming. So she called up her mom back in New Jersey and said, would you please pray that they do not call me until it's the one that's supposed to be in our home? And uh, the next call we got was for a two-day-old baby boy, which was Skylar, came to us from the hospital. Um, our agency told us that there were several other children that they had put us down as willing to take, but they didn't have the heart to call us. <laughs> and so it was the answer to that prayer, uh, that the next one. Um, so Skylar came, and we were here say roughly a year when we had uh, started fostering Skylar. Uh, just, I think our faith has grown most through stepping into that gap. Um, because during that time, the economy crashed, state stopped offering services to his mom, so they were hosting visits and doing drug tests and all that and they didn't have the money and resources so they stopped but God was in it because it caused us to begin to meet with his mom uh, for visits and she had a, a respect and the care for us if if she was not in a healthy state she would cancel the visit um, and, and not just show up and make a scene and stuff but we got to hear Kat's story his mom's story and she was eight years old her dad had moved here from Hungary and her mom sent her and her sister here to uh, for the summer while they were out of school and when it was time to go home like two days before a day before mom called up and said I know no I started a new life and it doesn't include you too you're staying there with your dad dad was an alcoholic and uh, their uncle was sexually abusing them in the home and so for us, starting out, all right, we, we stepped in the gap with blinders like this. How could a how could a parent not do everything they could to get their child back? And, and we had a lot of a lot of assumptions along the way, um, a lot of blinders on. And but through hearing Kat's story, you know, God peeled back our, our vision to be able to to be able to see. Right? A lot of times, it's it's a very broken story that causes the broken story. Uh, it's a saying, hurt people hurt people. And so we have unofficially have adopted Skylar's mom. We now have his uh, biological brother with the same mom. He's six years old. So we're raising those two. Um, and then we'll take them and go visit with their mom and even have crazy talks about maybe bringing her out to stay on the property with us. And 
we need to know God's leading it because in time she's still active in addiction and stuff. And so I believe if he calls us to it that he will do a work in her heart and life that will bring the transformation that we're seeing. Uh, yeah, lots of gaps along the way. With Skyler at, uh, what was he, almost, I guess a year and a half is when I finally lost my job during that downturn in the economy and it wasn't looking good to be able to stay in Arizona. Uh, my father-in-law had been trying to get me to come back to New Jersey to help pastor the church back there and I said, we're, we're not going to move until we, we see what's taking place with Skyler. Um, and then lost a job at that time didn't see a way we could stay. His mom did one of the greatest acts of love that I've seen. She ended up severing her rights so that Skylar could stay with our family. Uh, he he was going to be required to go to a different foster home here in Arizona so we could physically get to New Jersey and get licensed. Uh, the night my wife and kids were getting on the plane the next day, so last night we were all going to be together, my wife, our two girls were getting on the plane. We got a call that night from his caseworker saying he could go to New Jersey. Uh, three times she had posed it to uh, the district attorney or whoever, like, hey, we'll say it's a long vacation. They could go on vacation. If they have to come back, they'll come back because they're allowed to go out of state on vacation if we could get it approved. They said, no, we can't do that. Well, what if we do it this way, right? That they know the house they're going to stay in. Can we get it studied before they're there? We can't do that. And then there's one other way. And so it looked like we were going to have to leave him here. We were dreading it. And then the night before is when we got the call saying he could go. So he got on a plane. We adopted Skyler in New Jersey as an Arizona adoption. Uh, got licensed there. Friends of ours went and took the classes with us in their home. They're in South Carolina and now. They've adopted three uh, through the foster care system, have their, uh, have two biological, they adopted three. Eventually my cousin and his wife, they also fostered and have adopted, I think, three as well. Um, and then family is telling you about the school teacher, her and her husband, they have now fostered and adopted two mm -hmm. through Arizona. They're in the East now. But yeah, we moved back out um, when we were going through a, a very broken season of life, the two years in New Jersey, got back out here, um, God did a major work in my wife's heart, um, like transformation happened. She grew up in the pastor's home, um, but was going through the motions, and two years back out here, is she kind of broke, and... She said, either I'm going to surrender my life or take my life. And then uh, that season, Skyler's caseworker's daughter ended up in our daughter's class. We moved to Queen Creek, and uh, her husband looked at the list and said, how would you say that name? And it was my daughter's name. And Amy's like, I know that family. And the teacher said, no, they moved from out of state. I don't think you know them. And so she reached out. Um, and in this season, again, God had just done a, a work in, in our life, our marriage, our family. And we said, we were told that there was a lot of need still. And we said maybe one or two more. So at that point, we've had our third biological surprise pregnancy. Um, adopted Skylar, and we had our two girls, so four total. And we thought that was family. And she said, would you consider... You know, open reopening your license. So we said maybe you know we could help one or two more kids, and we took in twin newborns at that time. Um, and then, actually, Amy, the caseworker, had already adopted their older siblings, um, and that's how she found out that these twins were coming into care. So she ended up taking the siblings and adopting them. So we ended up, yeah. Each time we would be like, no, we're, our house is full, we can't take any more. Um, we had Anthony and Serenity, and we ended up adopting them. And somebody called, oh, Amy called us up and said, would you guys consider taking another kid? And we said, no, our license is full. We were licensed for two, 
And she said, well, you adopted them. I said, yeah, that means they're still in our home. And they said, well, no, that opened up two beds on your license for foster care. Like, that makes absolutely no sense. But, you know, M Michelle said, if you talk to our agency and they say yes, because they kept saying no, we would consider it. So the night before, I think I had told somebody, like, no, we, we're at our numbers. We're at the limit that the state will allow. Uh, the beds are full. Um, and then Michelle had said, I think the night before, if there's any age we couldn't do right now, it would be a newborn. And the call was for a newborn baby girl. And she said, okay, if my agency says okay, we'll consider it. And the door opened up, so Avery, who is nine, uh, she came. But, you know, God's hand on it. At that time, we were also fostering a 13-year-old boy who had come out of I met him at Canyon State Academy and uh, had taken him in from, from Canyon State Academy and we were going through a very rough time. Uh, but God's timing on stuff, he would, he would hold Avery, can I give her the bottle, can I? And so every time we thought, no, nope, we, we don't have the means anymore, uh, we would see God, God come through in big ways. Uh, as he was talking, you know, we've had two years that have been very rough recently with a couple of our boys, um, which has been really hard. As we, we pause and we think, like their hope is what we've shown them, right? The relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, outside of that, they're, they're mental health issues, but still trying to hold on to it in their own might and figure out this world, how to manipulate. No, they know how to manipulate, but they're trying to do it according to the fleshly way. And so that, that's taxing at times, uh, hard at times. There's been a period of time people would say, you're not going to take any more, are you? When are you going to stop? And in private, I'll share this here, <laughs> uh, in private my wife would say, we, we could stop when others will start, um, would be the conversation that we'd have there because our, our church at the time up in Mesa, um, I think we were the only family that was uh, caring for kids, and, and they were, they had a demonstration in front of them, you know, a, a family that opened up, and not a family that, you know, had great means or anything, but stepped in a spot where felt that there was a need, um, and just not moving, and so she said, we could say no, and others will say yes, 500,000, half a million. You know, kids in, in foster care, group homes are, are full. They've tried shifting away from group homes because it lacks uh, the family bond. And, you know, gangs will target group homes and foster kids. Uh, sex trafficking. We went to one event. I think kids in foster care, the percentage of likelihood that they will be trafficked is huge compared to um, you know, kids raised in, in homes, and, and they'll target group homes and uh, befriend kids. And so it's, there's a major gap to be stepped into. Um, and I, somebody tried telling, telling Michelle and I that we were extraordinary people, and we're ordinary people. Yes. Right? He's the extraordinary. Yes. And as we possess the extraordinary, we can do it. What have you learned the most through this? Ah, so many lessons. Uh, one, to be open-handed. Right? Our culture has many standard normal idols that we don't, we don't even recognize them as that. Um, and to just step in that place with, with open hands and to do things that you know, your culture would tell you, like, this is what you go after. Um, those things aren't as important as going after after His will. And so, like that, I was just sharing, we were in the, when we re engaged and re licensed, we were in a four bedroom, three, three bathroom house. Uh, three bedrooms upstairs, two bathrooms upstairs. And I think we got up to 10 or 11 kids while we were living in that home. Uh, my wife and I gave up the master bedroom 
and moved into the, the guest bedroom that was downstairs and had two bunk beds and another bed, so five girls sleeping in the master, two or three toddlers in another bedroom and like three boys, three boys at the time in another room. I don't know if my math was right there or not, but you know, we at that point had, had given up and we were completely content in that house. Um, weren't looking for another home um, and God did bring uh, the next home that we were in, in in Johnson Ranch ended up being a seven bedroom five bathroom house and and then we gave that that home up um, so I, I guess part of it you know I, I think of a lot of the Bible stories like God delivers the Israelites out of Egypt to bring them to the edge of the Red Sea All right and, and there's so many times in the walk where it's like Okay, God, if, we're, if we didn't hear you, we're in trouble right now. And situations and circumstances that come up in life that will make you feel like I must have heard wrong. And I imagine the Israelites standing at the edge of a sea when they're supposed to be fleeing an army. Uh, probably were thinking they took the wrong, wrong directions or something at that point. But then it's in those moments where you watch God do something that only God can do. And your faith, right? The, the eyes of flesh... It's like, man, I don't want to look through those. I want to see this through God's eyes, through the kingdom's eyes. And you watch Red Sea's part. You know, the, the other time they had to cross the Jordan River, and it's at flood stage. And he tells them, all right, the guys carrying the ark need to get into the river mm -hmm. before I do it. Right. And a lot of times, our American culture, we chase being comfortable. We chase having our ducks in a row, um, being affluent as we, we, we tend to um, use as a gauge of how well we're doing. Um, you know, the cars are in good shape, running well. Um, but that's, that's not a good kingdom gauge of how things are. Uh, obedience and uh, taking steps that require faith is a gauge of how well we're doing because sometimes again back to those those steps of faith we looked at the life of Job when he was going through all that test and trial we go according to some of the prosperity gospel and the American culture well, he messed up someplace right God's getting them for something but we know the story and it was God who said have you considered my righteous servant Job and then he allows that so you know, wrestling with some of the, the challenges over the last couple of years, uh, a couple of the boys who are really struggling, Noah at 11, um, who finally had gotten him to a, a therapeutic group home, and when I took him there, you know, there was nothing to point to Christ in that home. And I said, okay, God, I, I don't understand what's going on. We're still praying and trusting you. Uh, and then he freaked out in that home, started hitting staff, ended up in the... Um, mine 24 7 uh, we had to call DCS on ourselves one of the scariest things to do we've been investigated three times over this last year because of these two boys things going on with them and so here we're having a call saying hey my son's at this facility they're saying he needs to be picked up and we cannot ensure his safety or other safety if we pick him up and so so you're going to abandon your child. Well, no, that's not my, our intention, but we're letting you know we, we can't pick him up. And so I, did, I made the call, and it, it was scary. And the lady called the next day. She said, all right, I'm the night worker, and I don't think we're going to take custody. There's no reason we should. And I'm just, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you that they had eyes to see, mm -hmm. because there's so yes. many times like, hey, you have two beds open. No, those kids are still in those beds. We adopted them. That doesn't make sense. So yeah. A lot of times you're working with a, a broken system. Yes. Uh, and I often say that the, the state has stepped into a job that the, the church is better suited to do. Uh, but as the state has stepped in and done, the church has stepped back and allowed. And it's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, one of the elders from uh, We Are Church in San Francisco, that's that house church network that uh, Francis Chan had started he was out here doing a training and our group of elders had met with him 
and uh, I started sharing some of the trials of this year and, and Sean just looked at me and he says, we probably have a lot more in common than you realize. Um, and he also said that a lot of us as Christians that go into uh, foster care and caring go in with, with good intentions, right intentions, the Father's heart, but a lot of times we run into some situations that don't go the way we had thought. Correct. But even in those, I know God remains sovereign. My two boys that aren't in my home right now um, are suffering effects of sin. Um, some their own, some their parents, some the society has perpetuated down. Um, but we've given them enough light that they no longer have to continue in that. Right? They, Anthony tells us, that, you know, I know God is real. I've heard God. I just don't think I want to do what he wants me to do. And so he's in this spot of, of opposition. But I can't say too much because I, when I was in high school, that was the place I was in. Yes. I knew God. I, I believed God. I, I felt he had a call for my life. But my life was more important than that call. And I pursued it up to the year I graduated and then shift took place there. Uh, I have one daughter who at the youth right now she's she's still wrestling with the whole notion of God she believes God and it's crazy because I strongly feel that God has a missionary call on her life hmm. there's this desire she's learning a variety of languages there's this desire to to travel um, and we were at a we were at the training with We Are Church at the Nazarene Church up in Mesa. And uh, in that, Sean or Rob, one of them started talking about some people called to the mission field. And as he was saying it, I just sensed Tiana's name on my heart. And I said something to her after she got giddy. She said, I kind of felt something like that too. She's still wrestling with it. You know, her background, her dad would get drunk, get high, would line the kids up and start beating them. Her older siblings are a, a mess. They would hide the younger ones, Tiana and her two younger brothers, in cabinets and stuff that, so that they would not be abused. Um, he would have one woman that he was living with, they would go over to another woman's home and uh, you know, he would put a movie on and, and be with the woman while he was there. They went to, I don't know if it was her biological mom's home at one point, and he made them stay in a room, and they heard all kinds of chaos going on, and the house was trashed and blood, and, and these are some of the traumas that she's dealing with. So she sees a uh, therapist weekly, and the therapist had asked her, what do you deem as success? Draw me a picture, draw me a chart. And she drew a person sitting in a chair and herself on her knees in front of the person washing their feet is what she drew as what she envisions as success. So she's, she's not walking in it fully yet, but God's talking to her. But God is talking and she's listening and, and she's open. Um, you know, Izzy's heart is, is huge. And, in her mind, she could be all over the place, but you know her care and stuff, and, and so you see a lot of of what God's doing. Uh, the biggest part I see the gospel in yeah. in adoption. Right, we were we were uh, well, children of wrath, and God has redeemed us. He's bought us back with the blood of Jesus and adopted us and makes us co-heirs with Christ. When we adopted Skylar in New Jersey, uh, the judge, the judge when he was, it was neat because the judge we got normally does uh, custody battles. But the judge we were supposed to have happened to be sick. And so we ended up with, with this judge. And uh, the judge at the end says, it is now as if Skylar was born to Chris and Michelle Dahlman. Wow. He has every right that their biological children have. He has rights to their inheritance. 
He has rights to, to everything, right? The health insurance, everything that our natural children would have, Schuyler has all those rights. And that's the gospel. Uh, because of the blood of Christ, mm -hmm. we become heirs and co-heirs of Christ, of the kingdom of, of God. I'm going to have to wrap it up, Tom Wise, but I'm going to ask you this. How can we pray for you as a, as a group? Yeah, my, my main one I always turn to is, is discernment and that he directs our steps. That's... Because none of us in this room of the age where we really can even think of adopting children anymore. But we can love and support those that do. Yes. I have two adopted grandchildren and they're as good as my own. Yep. I don't see them as anything else. And they have children who are my great grandchildren, they're my own. No, you know, I don't see adopted anymore. Yeah. Um, you're looking off the kids in your house and it, it's a challenge but God's challenged us to step in the gap but not only us I think he's also challenging us to support the people that do step in the gaps and help them and give them the love yeah. the, the main way there is going with with open ears and an open mind because a lot of times if somebody's caring for kids that are, have come through the foster care system, a child may look completely normal and in front of you act completely innocent. Uh, and if the parents are saying, oh my goodness, there's a good chance there's things that are happening within the home that the kid would never do in front of others. Yeah. Uh, and so right, this... We had a family come stay on our property, and she had asked, she's like, all right, what do we need to know before we show up? Uh, and that, that openness um, to be, to be a, just a support and encourager like Barnabas in, in those situations. And, and building a loving enough relationship that if you see something, you can say it from a spot of love. My mother-in-law had said, this ain't right, this ain't right. Some of the, the way you guys are handling some things are not right. But because of the relationship, right, we were offended, but because of the relationship, we've stuck it out, and now she can look and see the things that we were saying, like, you, you don't understand everything. Yeah. And she could see now and, and you know, see it from a, a different light, but the depth of relationship has to be present to be able to, to really go deep and be able to speak words that can be taken in a hard way, but relationship helps us to be able to say that and, and maintain, keep, keep building relationship. Thank, thank you for sharing that with us. Wow. As we close in prayer tonight, I'm, going, I'm not going to say any more. I think enough has been said tonight to, to, to understand what it takes to step in the gap. And it's challenging at times. And, and don't think if you step in the gap, it's going to be a comfortable situation. I think that's what the message we get. There's going to be challenges. Yeah. We've got to trust God. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you for Barnabas setting the example for us and stepping in the gap with Paul and being the gap between what people feared Paul as and what he actually had changed to and solidifying that relationship between Paul and the early Christian church and think of how Paul went on and oh, what a great leader he was in the early church Lord I pray tonight that in our own lives we will be open to you that if you call us we will answer if you lead, we'll follow. If you speak, we will listen, Lord. But I also pray that you'll help us to be aware of what's going on around us. And I pray for Lord Chris and Michelle and the family tonight, Lord. I pray that you will continue blessing them and blessing at home. And Lord, as they follow your will, that you will bring peace to their hearts. 
And we pray for those scared, especially the one daughter that's at the moment not quite sure where she is. We just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will talk to them and love them and just woo them to you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We will speak again next week as we look at the life of... Uh, I'll find it. Sorry. Drive through any city long enough and you'll yeah. eventually get to... I will find it. Drive through any city long Sorry? enough, no, and you eventually no, get no. to that part of town. Okay, big gap. That was a big. <laughs> that was a very big gap. Big trip. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. I'm sorry I bounced it sorry. on you. No, yeah. But I just felt it was the right thing to do tonight. <sighs> Love you guys. Keep the faith, <laughs> and we will see you guys next week.